All right, everyone. Don't have camera lenses in her eyes. Sorry. She's got a spine. She's got lenses in her eyes. Yeah, that's cute. Uh, thanks for coming out today, everyone. Uh, this is our first event in uh, the fall speaker series. And uh, we, we just have hot off the press um, the, the detailed schedule of what we have going on this semester. So we have um, Dr. Bauer is actually going to uh, speak October 16th on uh, the, oh, right. the question, do philosophers actually do anything? So stay tuned for that. <laughs> uh, we have D Dr. Adam Graves from Metro speaking on freedom in the flesh, a hermeneutic of the will. That's October 30th at 3.30 p.m. And uh, we also have our first uh, ethics keynote uh, address. That will be November 15th, Dr. Leah Kalmanson. Uh, anyway, we have a great uh, series of uh, talks here, and we are getting things started with uh, the department chair, uh, David Hildebrand, is speaking today. Uh, and uh, most of you know Dr. Hildebrand. He got his uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. He's been with us for a eon now. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, today he's talking on uh, aesthetics and the experience of technology. So, though he uh, needs no welcome, let's start by welcoming him here. Thank you. I need your welcome. <laughs> um, so I wanted to pass, uh, I have a handout. Uh, I know, it's, it's a little bit of overkill maybe with information here, but um, uh, but this is a talk about how we have too much information, so I want to <laughs> demonstrate uh, why you need to believe. Um, I also spread out um, this flyer. Um, this is a little bit of early advertising for my own course, and the only reason I'm doing it is that it's really directly related to what I'm talking about today. So the course I'm giving in the spring will be talking about um, these issues and, and others also. Uh, so just if you're interested, um, sort of the specifics are, are there. So the way I'm going to proceed is um, I have a talk that's written out, and the talk has slides that go with it, and they're meant to sort of reinforce and not hopefully not collide with one another. So I'll read and progress through the slides. It'll probably take 40 minutes or so. And then there'll be plenty of time for conversation and questions and objections and that sort of thing. Okay. So, um, so to start, um, I want to start with a couple of quotes. Um, the first is from John Dewey, um, and the quote is, let's see, is that too dark or is that a, it goes in jazz club lighting? That's good. If I can, all right, if I have trouble seeing, I'll let you know. Um, the first quote is from John Dewey, and the quote is, um, it's not enough to insist upon the necessity of experience, nor even of activity in experience. Everything depends upon the quality of experience which is had. So I have some illustrations of experiences with different qualities. Uh, the second quote comes from Sherry Turkle, another person who I'm going to be looking at in this talk. And the quote is, technology and chance, it makes us forget what we know about life. Again, contrasts are kind of hit you over the head. But there's lines. So for most of my life, I've been, um, I've had a deep interest uh, and affection for technology. But I have to admit that my heart is changing. I'm increasingly tempted towards skepticism and even hostility about many new technologies. The stream of ne new technologies is incessant and the promise about their benefits is still hyperbolic. Technologists never advise scaling back or using less. But I'm more deeply concerned with technology's effects upon our most basic practices, those connected to families, work, friendship, and solitary time. I want to contend that technology is changing experience in fundamental ways, and these changes then permeate our practices. I contend to understand this phenomenon, we need philosophy in addition to various scientific approaches, psychology, sociology, and the like. 
This paper suggests that technology has created a problematic situation for much of ordinary experience. And my intuition is by no means unique. At this particular moment, many people are sounding alarms. There are now a raft of books on phenomena related to technology's effects on attention and our sense of life's pulse. So there are books on flow and focus. There are books on being productive despite distraction. Right? These are all, I was listening to a podcast on the Ezra Klein podcast with this guy. And so there are all of these things now about how we can be productive despite distraction. Um, there are books on how to adjust to or limit distraction. Right? So, um, you know, from the more thorough kind of approach to, you know, <laughs> this is this is sort of an updating. I know there was used to, there was an old book came out in the late '60s by a guy named Jerry Mander who used to be an advertising called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. So now we have Ger Geron Lanier, who was an early inventor of the multi-user domain environment, writing Ten Arguments for Deleting Your Social Accounts, and. Of course, there are always the books that tell us that we're all going to hell. <laughs> so you have sort of the more liberal Nicholas Carr. Um, this book was a bestseller. And, um, and the always, uh, always uh, conservative Mark Bauerlein, with the, it now, now so tenured and so high up in the academic ranks that he can just flat out insult uh, people just directly, <laughs> uh, the dumbest generation. So Houston, we have a problem. So I want to ask, what's the problematic situation that we find ourselves in? How should it be described? What might be done? These are the basic questions. And I want to be clear that the domain of my inquiry is everyday life. It's not the macroscopic institutional effects of technology, which I think is interesting, but not what I'm interested in now. What I want to do is investigate how technology, and particularly personal information technology, which I'm abbreviating as PIT, so if I say PIT, I mean personal information technology, like a cell phone. Um, I want to see how this affects and maybe revises our everyday experience. And my main theoretical lens is a pragmatist one. Uh, it's an account of an experience, and it includes <coughs> aesthetic experience. So let me telegraph a little bit about this pragmatist framework. Um, for pragmatists like Dewey, there's an iterative and cumulative relation between undergoing cogitating and acting. We encounter nothing in the raw. Uh, we think with purposes and feelings in mind and we act to fulfill them. Practices on Dewey's account are constituted by previous encounters, judgments, and experiments. They exist in contexts, environments, both <coughs> physical and cultural. And an environment can be fecund or barren for practice and its objectives. And Dewey describes this general framework as transactional or ecological. So given this, uh, given this framework, this general framework, what are the concerns? Um, the first concern is if the framework is right and it's true that pits are fundamentally altering experience, then we need to understand how. What is changing fundamentally, qualitatively, in the way we encounter the world? What is our change in our had experience in Dewey's lingo? Second, since reflective knowing emerges from and returns to had experience, then if, te if technology is changing primary experience, what are the implications for secondary experience, for knowing, which draw upon primary experience? Okay. Are the source materials of thinking being degraded? Could technology be directly affecting how we know or what we know? And finally, if primary and secondary experience is being radically altered by PIT, what is the upshot for practices? So those are the three concerns. So this paper wants to start addressing these concerns. <coughs> this is just the beginning of um, a way of looking into the question. And I'm going to proceed as follows. And I think I have this, I think I have this outline on the handout. Um, First, I want to use Sherry Turkle as the technologist to look at the facts, impacts, and concerns um, perhaps worth having with, uh, with personal information technology. Then I'm going to use some, 
some stuff from the pragmatists, Dewey, James, and John McDermott primarily, to help explicate the difference between primary and secondary experience, and offer they offer, I think, some nuanced ways to analyze what, what's the more basic level of, of experience, of primary experience. And then third, the first two items, technological impacts and uh, experience, are then connected with aesthetics, with pragmatist aesthetics, because I think that pragmatist aesthetics can help to construct new norms for technologies that are infiltrating our daily life. So essentially, this is, this is what I'm doing. We're going to look at the different ways, talk about some of the facts involved, right, how technologies are becoming uh, part of our solitude, our education, uh, what it means to be together, uh, and even what it means to enact very old rituals like dining. Right? Think about how technology is changing the everyday um, uh, experience, critique them, and then see what kind of reconstruction of some of these um, practices might be possible using the guidance of aesthetics, in this case, pragmatist aesthetics. And I don't think this kind of reconstruction would have to use a pragmatist aesthetic. It just happens to be the one that I know the best. So let's start with Sherry Turkle. So among the many good critics there are in technology, I'm going to draw today from Sherry Turkle. Uh, her work highlights, I think, profoundly pragmatic and practical issues, and she provides us with a good starting point. She is a psychoanalytically trained clinician, <laughs> and she's a sociologist at MIT who has been studying 30 years uh, technology for 30 years, analyzing and describing technology's impact on people's practices and identities. She's focused on um, therapy, mo mobile technology, social networking, social robotics. I imagine her work is familiar to, to some people. Has anyone heard of her before? I mean, she's more, she's well, well enough and known to get on PBS, so you know, that oh, explains. She's not been on Time Magazine. So, um, Turkle portrays in uh, Reclaiming Conversation, one of her more recent books, um, how PIT or PITs have pervaded our daily life. And her findings include some of the following statistics. And this is from 2015, so God knows it's, it's, it's had to have changed since then. So every six and a half minutes, Americans check their phones. Within five minutes of waking up, 25% of teens connect. Um, about 100 texts a day. 80% of teens sleep with their phones, 44% never unplug, even during sports, religious services. I don't know if they ask them about sex, but you know, <laughs> if uh, George Costanza is any guide, probably not. Um, and typically, um, students are consuming about four simultaneous media streams at any given moment. So that might be Facebook, text, email, right? So you can all imagine it, because I'm sure you, you all um, juggle it yourself. Um, so clearly, um, uh, the infiltration of these technologies is so widespread that many practices fundamental to our personal and professional lives are being revised. Some are quite basic to our cultural life. The family meal, um, breastfeeding, bathing and sitting with children, classrooms, office spaces, public spaces such as cafes and uh, cafes and um, restaurants and streets. These are all examples she uses in her book. So, so, some, so just to give you a sense of, of some of the, um, the venues that she's looking at for how technology is changing experience. Um, she talks about meals. She talks about breastfeeding. There's actually a growing literature about the effects of, because um, the eye contact is broken and it's supposed to be important. No, I haven't breastfed anyone lately. Um, the, the world's glee. Um, meals, right? There, so the, she talks about the rule of three, right? That in a, at a group meal, at least three people have to not be looking at their phone in order for it to not be impolite. So these are things I don't know, because, you know. Um, classroom environments, um, workspaces. And of course, uh, public spaces and the great outdoors are, uh, are all being affected, changed by, um, by these technologies. And of course, for philosophers, the cafe is changing. 
<laughs> so obviously, uh, uh, many norms are being changed, disrupted, destroyed by new technologies. And so I think it's important to avoid rash generalizations. Uh, I think there are some patterns of what technology is doing that are stable enough to deserve at least some analysis. Right? Maybe not val a value to a judgment, but analysis. Turkle organizes her work around um, uh, sociological and psychological concerns, uh, and she uses Thoreau as a pivot. She says, like, like us, right, like us, I guess she means like us academics uh, or thinkers, Thoreau sought to live deeply and authentically in a milieu that was accelerating towards clamor and, toward, and distraction. And in Walden, he writes of three chairs. And he says in, in Walden, Thoreau says, I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society, right, or conversation with others. And these three chairs in her work plot the points on a virtuous circle um, that links conversation to the capacity for empathy and for self-reflection. And she, she makes the connection, the virtuous circle, this way. She says, in solitude, we find ourselves, we prepare ourselves to come to conversation with something to say that's authentic, that's ours. When we are secure in ourselves, we're able to listen to other people and really hear what they have to say. And then in conversation with other people, we become better at inner dialogue. So in Turkle's analysis, technology disrupts this virtuous cycle because technology um, changes things. It says, always connected, the virtuous cycle breaks down. Afraid of being alone, we struggle to pay attention to ourselves and to pay attention to one another. And if we can't find our own center, we lose confidence in what we have to offer others. Just so you know, it's out there. Yeah. They didn't get the really big iPad. Give them that. So, um, what are the causes and effects of this disruption? Right. This there's a constant connectivity. This hyperattention. Technology, she's saying, alters some of our psychological and physical emotional habits. And what this does is it problematizes some basic aspects of psychological and social life. So it changes habits. So we want to look at, very briefly at some habits that are changed and some of the effects of those habits. So some of the habits that are changed are constantly shifting hyperattention, multitasking, <coughs> FOMO, which I didn't even know was an acronym, but everyone else did, uh, fear of missing out, right, about updates or even emergencies. Apparently, this, the, the generation she studies of teens are very, very worried that somebody is going to need them, they're going to be in trouble, there's a kind of constant concern. Um, she traces some of this to technology. Um, the use of devices to avoid intimacy. Um, she has extensive discussions of how um, people of a certain age just don't want to talk on the phone. They don't want that, it's too, they report to her that it's too intimate, right, that, that contact. I think it's a phone, right? Miles away. <laughs> Say anything you want, right? Um, then there are aspects of memory offloading, right, using devices to remember things. And, um, and then there's a kind of impatience with, um, with silence or lulls, boring, right, this kind of need for stimulation. Um, in her analysis, this has a number of different effects, right? There are effects of um, solitude becomes not experienced as solitude, but becomes experienced as loneliness. Uh, constant connection and hyperattention increase our impatience with silence and lulls, and we have an anxiety to escape this. That results in even more frantic connectedness. So there's a kind of vicious cycle there. Uh, crucially, from her point of view as a psychoanalyst, um, the uh, self-exploration of feelings and imagination is avoided in this sort of frantic escape. Uh, solitude is more and more experienced as loneliness. Uh, we're more anxious being alone with others. We're less able to be alone ourselves, and we're also less comfortable with other people. So quiet moments become awkward, 
uh, the solution is again more connectedness right, to devices. Uh, there's less eye contact, less intimacy, and this affects, of course, infant and childhood development. Conversations are impoverished. There are studies now that show that even if a phone is just on a table, face down, it changes the length and the depth of conversation. Um, there's, there's, an, there's a sense that uh, engagements can be friction-free, so the idea that politics can be done all through Facebook or Twitter or what have you, um, that, that, that many kinds of interactions can be done in a kind of friction-free way uh, facilitated by technology. Um, and there is, I think, the, the most, maybe the most interesting one for philosophers is this idea of existential displacement. This is my phrase, not hers, but this idea that life is always <coughs> elsewhere, that we're always somewhere else when we have a phone or a device. Um, it, there's a standing opportunity, which sounds like Heideggerian language, right? A standing reserve of being elsewhere, always with us at all times when you're holding a cell phone. And a cell phone in public has a, has a way of proclaiming, changing the public space as if to say, I'm busy, right? Uh, or don't disturb me. Um, you always have to sort of apologize when someone's out, like, uh, have a phone out, even in a public space. I, can I talk to you? So there's, there's this way in which this ability to always be elsewhere is now part of what it means to be together. So clearly fundamental changes are at work in our actions, our practices, and our norms, but at deeper levels of experience as well. And so what I want to do now is move from sort of these facts about, um, about technology and how it's changing some of the social and emotional spaces we're in to, um, to some of the work done by the pragmatists on um, sort of the, the phenomenology of experience. I think that their tool offer us, uh, their, their analyses of experience offer us some tools with which to assess technology's impacts that are different from psychology, sociology, and so forth. And so the experience tool, as I call it, also invites aesthetic alternatives that are not likely to be offered by futurists and technophiles. So let's look briefly at those. So pragmatic experience, for those of you who are not familiar with pragmatism, pragmatic experience, the idea of experience, helped to rebut or rebuke a long philosophical lionization with knowledge. Experience fit the emerging Darwinian worldview, where change, not permanence, was endemic of humans and human nature. Shifting the metaphor, spectating minds were replaced by adapting animals, right? Creatures finding and inventing resources and, um, to survive and to thrive. And so for the pragmatist, while experience definitely includes sensory and emotional components, as the tradition insisted, pragmatists rejected an input-output model. Uh, instead, sensation is cumulatively shaped by prior experience and it becomes selective. And so reflection is no longer a divine spark in us. It rather is a crucial way that creatures act. So once we're past the sort of experience versus knowledge dualism, pragmatists then investigated the many different functions that experience could have. Experience as consciousness, as attention, as inquiry, as judgment, as imagination, and so forth. So active, experiment, active experience is no longer waiting for validation by abstract concepts. Indeed, I think the pragmatist masterstroke is to declare the capacity of experience to adjust, to adjudicate the rightness of experience based on future experience. As John McDermott put it, the American bent towards the practical meant that both the method of reflection and the method of action are to be seen as conjoined and rotating functionaries of an experimental approach. So this basically means that experience itself has informing, directive, and self-regulating qualities that are both subject to intelligence and responsive to various contexts in which inquiry finds itself. So experience is educational, to put it in a nutshell. So there's a continuum in the pragmatist view of experience, a continuum from having experience to knowing experience. So Dewey rejects a strict radical hierarchy between knowing and experience. 
but he recognizes that there are functional differences between, say, sensing something or feeling something and judging. The more basic level of experience Dewey calls primary experience or had experience or encountered experience. It's felt, it's qualitative, and it's minimally regulated. The more complex level of experience he calls secondary experience. Here, one abstracts from immediate experience, uh, from immediate feelings or events, to describe, to organize, and to analyze the elements for some future purpose. So these kinds of experience form for the pragmatists as a kind of dynamic continuum that are interwoven in our lives. They're labeled for the purposes of philosophical analysis, but in our lives they are constantly mixed together and, inter and uh, intertwined. But for Dewey, still, and this is where we come back to the point of this paper, there's something more fundamental about primary or had experience. It forms a practical living starting point, whether we're acting, feeling, or calculating. So, you know, a way of putting it is that, um, you know, though there's this spectrum from having an experience to a knowledge experience, there is this something very, very basic about the having of experience, and that knowing things happens within, in a larger emotional and qualitative field. It's not a radical thing to say. In this department, in some departments, it would be much more radical. Uh, but the idea is basically that all knowledge happens within a larger qualitative context. So just to give a couple examples to try to, to make this maybe tricky into believing this, um, we might solve a crossword puzzle relaxedly or find our airplane gate hurriedly. So even times when we are investigating or calculating or using our rational capacities, they're happening in a context that has an emotional cast and character. There's a practical context, right? So those, those things affect what it is that it means to know or, or calculate. The point, one of the po important points for the pragmatists is that a primary experience or a had experience is not necessarily reflective. And so this is this asymmetry, right, that, that knowing experiences are had experiences, but had experiences are not necessarily knowing experiences, helps explain why Dewey called knowledge secondary experience. That's maybe a little in the weeds um, about Dewey, but the point is that it, it makes sense to understand what's happening out here if we're also curious about what's happening in there. So the point of reviewing the difference between had and reflective experience here is to draw attention to certain pragmatists' radical empiricism, right? The, the earnest insistence that not, to, um, not to let our preconceptions discount what happens in the stream of our experience. So looking closely at experience, they offered some very keen analyses of, experience, of primary experience, several handles to analyze uh, ex, uh, primary experience that's, I think, useful for um, for analyzing what's happening with um, with technology. So here are four different ways that pragmatists like Dewey and James and McDermott look at what's happening sort of in our encounters in primary experience. They look at relations and qualities, right? Looking at experience as a relational and also emotional. They look at um, sort of the fringe versus the focus, right? Noticing that much of philosophical attention has been on the clear, the obvious, the focal, um, and, and emphasizing um, that experience is pervaded with qualities, pervaded with feels and relations, as well as with, right, with um, rational foci. Um, they look at experience as capable of being cumulative and learning, and they look at different experiences of time. Speaking of which, okay, I think I'll I think I'll go over these a little bit quickly so as to not to drag the time our time out too long. Um, but so what I what what I do in the paper now is um, just if we work on each one of these and think about what is the analysis happening in each level, um, and so um, here. I, Again, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, 
James is, is changing the focus, um, uh, re relocating the focus on relations as opposed to always focusing on things. Right? So it's, it's not just the nodes, but it's the relations between the nodes. Um, Dewey is also, James and Dewey are also looking at relations um, in contrast with concepts. So there's a lot of focus on concepts in philosophy, and relations are um, given a little bit more uh, time in the uh, um, time under scrutiny. Um, James also uh, addresses this, this uh, philosophical uh, predilection to, uh, to look at things that are clear. And he says, our fields of experience and our fields of view are fringed over forever by a more that continuously develops and that continuously supersedes them as life proceeds. So there's this relocating of, um, of attention, not just to what's in focus, but what makes that focal thing um, what it is, right? So this is the figure ground tension that you, you come across a lot. Um, Dewey builds on James's notion of the fringe and he, uh, with his notion of the qualitative of inexperience. For Dewey, there is a unity uh, of qualitative experience that enables us, he says, to keep thinking. Uh, this is actually, um, I think this is from his logic. He says there's a unity in the qualitative uh, aspect of experience that enables us to keep thinking about one problem without our having constantly to stop and ask ourselves what it is after all we're thinking about. So you follow through these long problems, these long logical problems or these long calculative problems. What is it that keeps you sort of on track? There is, Dewey says, there's something unifying that focus that is not itself the logical center of the focus. Uh, and of course, if you think about what happens with distraction and fragmentation of attention with devices, you can see the, the implication of why analyzing the effect on primary experience by te technology would have an effect on something as focused as logical thinking or argument. So technology alters the fringe focus balance. because devices capture and keep our attention. I'm trying not to yell at people when I see them in the car next to me like this, going, because <laughs> they're just going to give me the finger, and I can, you know, I can get that at home. <laughs> so devices are, they're designed to capture and keep attention, right? They're bright, they're constantly moving, their stimuli is overt, they're, um, they're, right, they, they're not ambiguous. And so as they pervade our experience, our sensitivity towards the fringe diminishes. And potentially this could diminish the range of meanings that are available to us and our sensitivity to the range of meanings. So you see the implications for the aesthetic here, with constantly bright, shining objects. Um, the other aspect of experience to mention is the connotative, right? That experience is learning capable. Um, because, uh, as Dewey says about experience, and of course studying, uh, being involved in education most of his life, uh, for Dewey, experience is constantly associated back with what children are undergoing. And of course adults are undergoing it too, but children much more sort of actively and aggressively. He says, to learn from experience is to make a backward and forward connection between what we do to things and what we enjoy or suffer from things in consequence. Doing becomes a trying and undergoing becomes instruction, a discovery of the connection of things. So the direct bearing on technological experience is obvious when we consider the, how fragmentation and distraction defeat connective thinking. Devices deliver intense but isolated titillation at the cost of connotative primary experience. The last, um, the last dimension, just to mention, this comes from McDermott, is distinctions uh, about, uh, about how we experience time. Um, time was not, as William James argued, specious or a knife edge. Uh, the present is not this like knife edge moment in time. It's durational. James calls time a saddleback with a certain breadth of its own on which we sit perched and from which we look in two directions into time. 
McDermott extends James, distinguishing urban time from nature time. And we're all on urban time in case anyone. Urban time is faster, it's thin, it's tense, it's jagged, it's aligned with machines. Nature time is connected to diverse natural elements. It's thicker, it's liberating, it's continuous. And such differences help make sense of the onward rush of modern change. Um, McDermott wrote this in 1974. Right? He was living in New York, so it was a pretty fast paced pace. But he wrote, the network of communication media constantly tunes us in to sensorial multiple experiences. Our imagination, fed at all times by the messaging of electronic intrusions, races far ahead of our body, which we often claim to drag around. The speed of urban time revs up our capacity for multiple experiences, but also intensifies the need for interpersonal space to play out the experiences subsequently in our own good time. It's from 74. So now I think our predicament is even now worse, depending on how you look at it, or further advanced than what McDermott was, was talking about. <coughs> if you combine the portability of personal information technologies with the near omnipresence now of connectivity, and all spaces that we're in are potentially urban spaces, right? even nature. So and you and you as you know as you know you you carry the sense of time wherever you go even if you leave your phone at home. Um, urban time, information flow, constant interruption, a panic, the suspicion that there's not enough time becomes unrelenting. So, urban time is now everywhere. So, if there's a New Yorker <laughs> cartoon about it. Not this is. There's something that there's not a New Yorker cartoon for, or a Seinfeld example, I haven't found it. But. So urban time is it's just grown and grown and grown. I mean, Heidegger talks about all this in uh, the question of technology, right? This, this constant sense of ramping up. So, um, so to sum up, I think in the end we choose our technologies. We do choose. And they express our inclinations about how we want to live. Of course, many of us are not doing the choosing, right? Marketers are doing the choosing, and engineers are doing the choosing, and right people with quarterly earnings reports and targets to meet on Wall Street are doing the choosers, and they all make different choices. So I think one of the important things about talking about it is, is to try to make explicit what it is that's happening with these choices, right? Because you, you can't really know whether it's good or bad if you don't even describe it. So I think that the normative question is also an aesthetic one. And so that's why I think that turning towards aesthetics is um, a, an important thing to do. So the last section is just, I'll, I'll go do this pretty quickly, is about aesthetics and what it might offer. So Turkle and McDermott gave us accounts of technology as both descriptive and normative. They identified what's lacking or dangerous in the conduct that technology engenders. What grounds their normativities? Well, Turkle's a therapist, and so for her, she's assessing the effects on psychological well-being, sympathy, our empathy, our authentic, our ability to communicate authentically. Those are her concerns, and so she warns of technology-engendered evils like isolation, loneliness, disconnection and alienation. McDermott is offering, I think, the germs of a philosophical argument grounded in experience. So here, McDermott uh, is offering a kind of pragmatist aesthetic way to add standards to judge technologies, the patterns that technologies uh, is foisting upon us. And his basic uh, approach is Dewey's. So um, Dewey is offering um, you know, sort of hard to do Dewey's aesthetics in, a, in just a, a few minutes, but there's a basic contrast in Dewey and aesthetics between consummatory experience and what he calls the anesthetic, the opposite of consummatory experience. And so consummatory experience is like a whole experience. It is self-sufficient, it, uh, it stands apart, it's kind of those exceptional moments or experiences that hang together because they're their own internal constituents, 
in a way that's memorable and in a way that has its own qualitative unity. Um, it, it's, it's complicated to explain, but we have these experiences all the time. Um, they happen for Dewey, not just in artworks, although that's, that, those are good triggers for aesthetic experience, but the experience, even longer and shorter term experiences like problem solving or writing a book, playing a game, having conversations, having a meal, even he describes a perilous ocean voyage as being a possible subject of an aesthetic experience. And not all experiences are like this, but they all can be because of the, right, for the, for the sort of structural and uh, relational reasons he describes. Probably most useful for our understanding of technology is the opposite of of aesthetic experience or consummatory experience, which he calls an aesthetic experience. So an aesthetic experience is experience where, where there's, there are sort of, you could think of it as having sort of two different poisons to, uh, uh, two different kinds of poison to aesthetics experience. One is when there's slackness or dissolution, when nothing seems to be happening, when there's drift, the other is when you're under the gun, when there's constriction, or you feel coerced, or you feel rushed. Right? These, these are different poles of the anesthetic. Um, as Dewey says, the enemies of the aesthetic are rigid abstinence, coerced submission, tightness on one side, and dissipation, incoherence, and aimless indulgence on the other. So you may see that in, in some, of, some of these qualities are characteristic of some of the habits and effects of technology, right? The awkward lulls, the sense of being rushed, of missing out, right? There are a variety of effects produced by technologies which, which marry up very nicely with what Dewey describes as anesthetic, what is opposed to experience, right? As opposed to aesthetic experience, rather. Um, and so Dewey, I, I know we're, we're, we're getting late, but this is, this is such an important quote, I just have to, I have to read it, and then I'll almost, then I'll be done. Um, he says, this is written in um, Artist Experience, so 1934. Zeal for doing, lust for action leaves many a person, especially in this hurried and impatient human environment, with an experience of an incredible, almost incredible paucity all on the surface. No one experience has a chance to complete itself because something else is entered upon so speedily. The crowding together of as many impressions as possible is thought to be life, even though no one of them is more than a flitting and a sipping. What is called experience becomes so dispersed and miscellaneous as hardly to deserve the name. An individual comes to seek, unconsciously, even more than by deliberate choice, situations in which he can do the most things in the shortest time. This is in the 30s. And we have a film about it, right? You also, you've all seen this film, right? You all seen Kyanoscotzi or know about it? All right, you can go to my midnight movies. <laughs> it's a great film, and it's almost it's almost all like that. But it, it's trying to give this overwhelming sort of or, or comprehensive tableau of the different ways in which which in which life has sort of sped up and become complicated. So, conclusion. Again, this is my this is this is the project. This is the idea to look at the different ways in which technology has become embedded in um, solitude, education, uh, togetherness, even dining, those sorts of basic fundamental experiences of life, and to try to see if there is a way to critique what's happening in them using pragmatist notions of experience um, and also to say what might be wrong with them, right, to, to add in that normative or evaluative portion by saying, well, what, what, 
what form of life would be more satisfying, more fulfilling, more beautiful, and that's where aesthetics uh, provides some norms. So I think in the end, technology really doesn't matter. Uh, the, what matters really are empathy, care, justice, compassion, and consummatory experience. So the inspiration for me for, for even doing this work is prompted by me watching myself use technology, watching students use technology, watching my kids use technology, um, and wondering to what degree is distraction, ennui, and perhaps even depression coming about because of these technologies, these, the habits of, associated with them. So that's the question. What is technology's role in all of this? And that's what I want to find out. Hey, well, thank you for that talk, and, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm totally sympathetic to the critique of technology. I find it endlessly agitating thinking about what technology is doing and um, transforming inherited practices and practices that we find meaningful. But what I, so I'm wondering, though, about the connection between technology and what you're calling the aesthetic. Because, um, so I guess one, one way to formulate the worry is that the anesthetic has more to do with social relations than it does to uh, the kind of technology that we're worrying about. So for example, when I think about uh, times in my life where I've had a vivid experience of what I think Dewey's calling the anesthetic, it had to do with like working at the power plant during summer <coughs> in college, where work was completely coercive, you know, uh, and it, it was a matter of feeling that uh, this was not reflective of me in some interesting way. It's something I had to do, and then after hours, it was like all I could do to watch, you know, sitcoms. I was so exhausted and depleted. And I thought, you know, a lot of people, their lives are like this. Yeah. You know? But no doubt, people throughout history have been relegated to the anesthetic just because of social position, through social stratification, and so on. Yeah. And so while it's the case that, um, you know, the, the digital, digital devices may uh, make for depression, ennui, and these other things that I'm concerned about too. I, I wonder if I, I'm, I'm concerned that the anesthetic may be more a function of social relations all along and not really be um, connected as closely to uh, the device paradigm or something like that. No, I mean, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I, I, I guess. Um, I, I wouldn't want to claim that um, uh, the anesthetic is only produced by the te technological devices, but just some of the some of the qualities that make that kind of work right depleting um, or alienating um, are being produced now by um, the kinds of interactions that we're having with technology. I mean, but I mean, it wouldn't stand on a par, right? It would still be worth worse to work in a factory for nine hours than to be able to play on an iPad for nine hours. Um, but, um, but I mean, the more fundamental point of um, uh, is it is it the social relations really that are at at the at fault? Uh, and and I think that's probably true. And I mean, one of the things that Turkle does really well is, is she's, she's always, because she's been at MIT for 30 years, she can't be a, a simple Luddite and beat up on technology. In fact, she's made her career there. So what she wants to do is how technology changes the way people relate to one another. And, um, and I, I imagine that probably the best, she even suggests, she doesn't suggest getting rid of technology. She suggests, she suggests that technologists and people discussing the implications of technology talk about how technology should be 
um, modified, changed, maybe limited in, in ways that preserve some of the older um, uh, values uh, we have between us. So, I mean, I showed that picture. Um, so this, this I, I skipped past it because I didn't want to linger too long on um, on slides. But um, there's this picture. I mean, this is now available at IKEA. So they're building it into placemats, something that's translucent so you can see what's happening on your phone, but it's right next to your plate. So this is changing the way people relate at, at a meal. But, but I think you're right to say it's not really about the technology. It's about how people are relating to one another at the meal. So I don't know that we're, we have as much control over um, over this as we, we need to yet. Because I know a lot of times I will do things with my phone that I, I feel bad about afterwards. I think, well why didn't why didn't I stop? Why didn't I stop myself? You know, there was there was something going something going on uh, at the level of primary experience. I think my question is maybe closer or related to Rob's because I was thinking about um, how you're using Turkle and um, the way that technology is meant to be disrupting our experience. And I was thinking about um, Arendt's icon in Jerusalem where she says icon's able to do these, that people are capable of infinite, infinite evil if they don't think about things. Mm -hmm. And the problem with icon, right, isn't that he's inundated by technology. It's that even at the moment of his own execution, all he can do is produce a cliche it's not actually directly related to his own execution. Um, that would be a cliche that was applicable to a survivor of somebody else's death, right? And she's struck by his inability to think. Um, that does seem to go back to social relations, um, but that she would link to something like, this is why Socrates has such a terrible time in Athens. Right, so these much older examples. Uh, so I'm wondering just how virtuous our habits used to be. Um, that on Turkle's account is being interrupted by technology now, I'm wondering if it's like, make our habits great again, if there ever was that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think the Dewey quote actually kind of, so I think maybe the Dewey quote points toward <coughs> troubling the Turkle. That last quote from 34. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Would sort of like, because 34, I guess radio, Right, like what is it? There's well, not and, and sort of, of course, newspapers and penny newspapers. But not the and personal telegraphs. information technology that Turkle seems to be saying is creating this break. Right. So I wonder if, I, I just wonder if maybe your resources and pragmatism do point to these other sort of more fundamental issues that Turkle sees um, like technology is a particularly um, saturated point of disruption, but that that's, it's, it's not the thing. It's not the problem. Right. No. And uh, no. That's a good point. And and uh, when I presented this, I presented this or some version of this a couple of different places. And um, people are worried about whether Turkle is um, too sentimental about the past and so yeah. forth. I mean, if you if you read a couple of her books and you see the extensive amount of ethnography that she puts yeah. into it, she's been talking to a lot of people over a long time. Uh, and they're reporting these things to her, and technology is implicated in it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think she's, I presented her in a way as sort of saying, L let me stir up a basic issue and think, well, there's a way of getting at it which is, which is more f friendly to philosophers. Uh, I mean, it's more in our wheelhouse, and we're not as worried about productivity and some of those other things people are concerned of. Um, I don't think she's as sentimentalist as, as um, it, it might seem from my presentation of her, but I would agree that uh, we don't, I don't think her, if you read her books, I don't think she, she sort of raises philosophical issues and then moves on. So she doesn't spend enough time looking closely at what's, what's happening to social relations or what's happening to the quality of uh, experience in some ways psychologists who are studying how we form memories and how we you know how we uh, <clears throat> think deeply sort of um, uh, are getting a little bit closer but um, 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that the, the problems are probably more fundamental. It's just that since technology seems to be everywhere, we have a lot of available observ observations to make. And we also have a lot of, I mean, I, I'm thinking about my own uses. My, my own uses have changed so much <coughs> over the past 10 years that it gives me something to, to navel gaze about. <laughs> Someone is looking for, yeah. Well, maybe just a, just this a way to, to accommodate both Rob and Sarah's point is, is just, as you were saying, is yes, this has been present, part of human beings. It's just that technology is crack. Is, right? Did it's, you say it's crack? Crack. Yeah. crack? It's a yeah, right. Right. Crap, crack. It's, it's okay. like crack. You know, like crack. Right, right, right. It's crack. Right. It's exactly. straight up heroin like in, the, in the jugular. It's... <clears throat> it's designed explicitly, for example, free-to-play games are designed to take advantage of the primitive structure of the human being, the human's brain, right. to keep you addicted on free-to-play and drop a thousand dollars on Candy Crush, right? That's insane. It's idiotic. That it's directly built to disrupt the human's neural system. So while there may have been these pre-existing states and human beings that was causing dysfunction, <clears throat> much of this is designed explicitly. Uh, Facebook is designed this way explicitly, right? Free-to-play games are designed this way. Instagram is designed this way. They're designed explicitly to disrupt. They're built, right? It's not an accidental byproduct that we built these things and folks became socially isolated <clears throat> and they didn't participate. It's built to destroy the human brain. That's what they're for. Um, so that gives you kind of, yeah, we can conceive that we've always had certain sorts of problems, but this critter is a new special critter. Now the real question I had to you is, wait, these things are here. So help help us figure out how do you live with the bastards? All right, what's the next the next step? Like how do we reaccommodate technology so it doesn't destroy us? Right, and I and I think uh, uh, um, was that the end of your question? I ain't gonna say anymore. I oh, okay. Okay. No, I'm just, just don't want to cut you off. Um, no, I, I. They are here, and I think we just have. We haven't had a lot of. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about what it's like to be with them or to have them. I mean, to think about what they're doing to the quiet moments, to the reflective moments, to the the kind of things that we worry about because we're thinkers, we're talkers, we're readers, um, we are. We're interested in the aesthetic, and so it's um, to understand what it's doing to sort of that kind of. The, we're, we're all interested in attention, and so to understand what it's doing to attention, and then the costs on human relationships and the costs on knowing and stuff like that, that gives us some basis to make an argument against the Silicon Valley engineer, against the Facebook marketer, against the FCC regulator. Or to right, we can't ask for new laws or new restrictions, new regulations. We can't ask for boycotts of certain products unless we have some way of framing what it is that they're doing to something valuable to us. And in this case, it would be attention, reasoning, right, the ability. To, but yeah, it's very, very powerful. And I, um, but she, she's very. Um, Turkle is very, um, very strongly warns against using the language of addiction devices because she thinks that puts the ex puts a very complicated set of s experiences in a box calls it bad and then says we really just need to quit the habit but she says they're very it's very different sometimes we're using our phone to coordinate a pickup with our kid at school and sometimes we're using it to find our way around a city I mean technology has so many different uh, uh, positive things that you, you obviously they're here and they're not going anywhere. The question is to use a, a, a phrase from uh, Alan Drankson who wrote uh, Four Philosophies of Technology, interesting article. What is what is appropriate technology look like? And you can only answer that if you think about what it is we want to do and how what how what it is that we want to keep and what it is we want to. Yeah, that was the only thing I was kind of wondering with you is, is how would we. What's the picture going forward about how do we mobilize mobilize tech in a way that says does the opposite, increases right, removes solitude, increases social interaction, right, 
accomplishes the goals that we want while using this product. Well, they have apps that will shut your phone off, shut thing right, you know, shut yeah, your internet right. off, but they seem kind of crude. Yeah. Yeah. See, I mean, in part, that's why I go to aesthetics at the end, is because we can't really know how it is we want to limit or change technology unless we have some kind of ideal that we want to go for. And the having of really interesting experiences like, uh, you know, having a meal or, or, you know, those various things that Dewey talks about, um, you can really multiply your own examples. Um, too many slides. Too many slides. Um, there, there are so many different experiences that we, we, I was talking to Brian about this before, is that I'm trying to remember the last fiction book I read from beginning to end, and it, I, I have to admit it's, it's been a while because so much of my free time is spent reading articles here and there, and even long form articles, it's like I, I wind up with 18 tabs across my browser and a promise, each top tab is a promise. <laughs> yeah, Paris oh Review is great. And, you know, so, good question. So, I wanted to, <clears throat> to ask something about the aesthetic, too, and, I, and one thing I wanted to do with, with Mark that, um, some of these games are created just like cigarettes are created. And that is with the, with the intention of hijacking certain um, systems in our brains. And the reason is because that's how you make money, is you get people excited. It's um, about rare but very rewarding um, surprises when you get something. So I won't say I'd be the last person to say that addiction language puts something in a box and says that it's the box that does the thing. I don't think that at all. But I do think that certain ways of using those um, are consciously created in order to keep people from doing one thing and being drawn back to, to, to do that again and get that little bump again. But you yourself said technology is not the main issue, but rather it's um, empathy, care, justice, and consummatory experiences. And I'm thinking, but I have read some novels this summer because, well, you know, I wasn't in Paris and I wasn't doing all this stuff and writing books like Sarah and everything. I was lying in bed reading this novel that I was going to get done. I mean, some novels, but some of these, I mean, some many things I have in my my daily life, um, I feel that empathy is disrupted and that care is disrupted and there are people who are always going to not think, right? And that's what, well, I mean, we run into them all of them. But that's, I was just listening to a podcast about Han Arendt, to oh, thinking yeah. about, yeah, okay. um, thinking about what, she, but the podcast, see, lets me think about this Han Arendt for the whole time that I'm, um, driving or doing something else that I don't want to do or doing, yeah, well, in my case, doing makeup, and I don't want to talk about that either. But the the idea that I mean, the okay, so there there are always going to be non thinkings taking place, but with the constant distraction and the knowing that in my pocket or um, or in my purse there are these calls to me from Facebook and calls to me from whatever it is that might be interesting, I find that all I ever want to do is one thing. And the struggle to clear myself from one, th to be able to do one thing and have an experience. Because I've been reading Mark Johnson and I've been thinking about this notion of experience. Um, even when I go sit and listen to the, the Philharmonic, I have this constant, oh no, is that on? Is it going to buzz? Did I turn it off? I don't want to pull it out and make the light. <coughs> it and so it's always got this other right, interruptive power, even right. when I'm trying not to do it. <coughs> right. I don't, I don't know what I, I don't know what I want to say about that. It's just that I see that this is a very complicated situation with some things that are very good and some are bad. But the whole idea of an aesthetic experience seems like something that almost doesn't happen unless you go hike somewhere where you don't get perception. Because then it takes it out of your hands and right. then 
<laughs> but what yes. is it? How, and what, then you, we have nothing to do but talk with each other. <laughs> yeah, and what is it they say? How many days it takes to unlearn a habit? So even if you go on a on a wireless vacation, right, or a, a internet free vacation, or you go into the woods where there's no cell service, you can calm down to a large degree. But a lot of the habits that are that uh, that are with you most of the time uh, don't just leave you alone when you go off in the woods. You do have a different experience, but yeah, I... Um, you start to have one that can be a complete thing. Yeah. No, I'm... Um, I guess... Here's one that happened, yeah. and I don't even know what you'd say about this, because this was too weird. I, so I've never been to a CUC, CSU yes. football game in my life. I've hardly ever been to a football game in my life. But this one I went to, and what I noticed was they had those big fan cams on, right? And all of these kids are there, and they're two teams. One's all in the white, and one's all in the green. And they keep showing them. And for at least until one team started to win by a lot of points, at the beginning, all of these kids, the, even though it's certainly not conversation or artwork, or something, they didn't have their phones out because they kept scanning around and showing these kids and, and I was shocked, and finally I, I couldn't think what it is that I'm seeing. And I'm seeing all these teenagers without their phones. Now, when the game lulled and all that, you started seeing everybody. But they were just doing something together. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, um, I don't, I, I'm thinking about what it, what, I think you put it well, is what is it, what is it, um, what does it take to do just one thing? Because I'm not a Luddite and I'm not going to stop trying to do lots of things at once. And I mean, I like to have a big pot of coffee in the morning and, and do 15 things. Yes. But, but there's a difference. Something is changing about, about how hard it is to do just one thing or to stick with something. And this is where I think um, I wouldn't have made this argument if I thought I was just being like an old fogey arguing against all the digital natives. Because something, there's something qualitative about experience which is uh, valuable for them too. The ability sure. to be quiet or to be mindful is the word now. That, right, that's how they've commodified what the opposite is of uh, hyper, hyper stimulated is mindful. So there's a commodified version of what the opposite is. But that's this this ping pong back and forth is not like a way to sort of grab hold of a, you know, is this true time in Neo that we're heading towards or and it doesn't doesn't feel like it. No, it doesn't. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh yeah, that's Ray Kurzweil calling in to tell me who uh, I gotta go do it with cops. Sorry. No. Okay. What did you just say? Cops. I have a bad kid. Oh. Well, this is the first time I've had that interruption. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Um, bad kids also yeah. are very oh. I think there was a, a question, I guess, implied, like, when will technology actually help us connect more? I don't think it fits possible. Um, I, I think there are some examples where it has happened. Uh, and maybe like an imperfect one is I can cite a lot as like the Arab Spring that was sort of mm -hmm. uh, happened over Twitter as far as coordinating against government forces. Uh, but like more generally, I think about how social media helps amplify voices that don't typically have access to like mainstream media outlets or institutional outlets. Uh, uh, that can help amplify their voices. So I guess, do you think there are any ethical implications for us to unplug and sort of uh, disconnect ourselves from those otherwise unamplified voices. Yeah, I think there are, um, and I mean the um, so a longer version of this argument is um, has just come out, and um, I looked at some 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 technologists uh, uh, who write about what are the things that technology facilitates. So it facilitates connection at a distance. It facilitates friendship. Facilitates like the reason I'm on Facebook is because the exchanges I have are seem to be teaching me something and and, and being real. 
and so there are lots of things that the technology facilitates. So this is just a quite so this is just a way of saying I think we should focus on um, maybe on how it changed some of the most basic ways in which we we have ex we have experience. Not to not to unplug or throw it out, but also to ask, because I think the the the, the comeback to the Arab Spring example is like how they doing now, right? Which is that there was a there was a kind of promise of it. There was a technophilic promise of it. It facilitated something, but usually what technology facilitates is only really goes anywhere if there are those sort of more fundamental interpersonal connections. Neighbors who know neighbors, people who are willing to go door to door, um, people who are willing to right, stand together. So it's, it's, I think it's a both and kind of solution. But this is really a question of what is it? What is a sort of constant bombardment by information, constant availability? What is it? Does is it doing something to? Uh, and we might say it's doing something to us, and I like it, and I want to keep it. But at least then it's a considered reflective judgment. Um, I mean, my kids are not not that reflective about what it is that they're growing up amidst. But I didn't make that world for them. Someone in, someone in Silicon Valley did with certain market imperatives and imperatives to sell them stuff and get their data and right. So those are all of the things that are shaping their experience with technology come from designs and imperatives that I didn't have anything to do with and I have no idea what to do with them. Maybe, maybe there'll be an Arab Spring here. <laughs> I do worry about the kids that feel like they can't go to school without their phone because they think if they're absent their parent 10 minutes, if they can't, if they have to put it in the thing at the door of the school, of the classroom, that something's going to happen and their parent's not going to be able to get them or they're not going to be able to get their parent and all of that. And I just used to, I mean, of course, that was a, in the good old days when you could drop them off and find out they had chicken pox eight hours later when they came home with a fever and everybody right. was already infected. So that was, I mean, the good old days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I had to get chicken pox. Yeah, yeah, yeah when you were to, Back when I was a kid. That's right. <laughs> and you had to get it twice. But, um, yeah, so, but that's not, I mean, okay, there's one, right? That That's really good because the reason I got a cell phone to begin with was so that the teachers at the Montessori could get a hold of me and I could say, okay, I'll be right there or call somebody who could be right there and get that. And that, that's that's really helpful. It gives me peace of mind while I'm teaching my class, a little kid. Well, some, but there is an anxiety that goes with that. Like, McKenna was just at an appointment right now and I know that she is, um, can't, finish it without being dying to tell me exactly what, I mean, right now, exactly right. what happened to it and all that. So even while she's in it, she's already thinking about what do I do and how do I get back it. Yeah. And so it's it's in there even during the thing, which kind of prevents the thing. See, there's me. a nice little, there's a little form in it. If you go to the uh, website, if you go to... Um, uh, Nicholas Carr's website. He, there's a little four-minute YouTube video about uh, about the costs of constantly being connected, and one of them is that a lot of times things don't accumulate because while you're taking in the stuff, and uh, it's it's becoming something that you'll remember later. You want to tell it to someone, or you get distracted, and so it goes away. I mean, maybe Homer wouldn't have written. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, if he could have just like told people little bits and parts of it all along. <laughs> in other words, sometimes it takes time for That's what stuff I to accrue. Like taking Facebook and all your whole vacation. Because you're so busy showing everybody how much fun you're having, you're not having fun. Or Snapchatting an entire concert. It's like, what? you're not exactly. even there. <laughs> exactly. Right, there's something to abandon. It. Like, I like to all do right. mine all in a dump. You know, every other day, there's something like that. Now, look at my vacation. <laughs> no, but there is that because it's always in there. Sartre said something about that too, about not having the experience because of, re of recording the experience, and that always struck me on vacations. I I want to do this. I don't want to spend my time recording it. And then of course I became obsolete, so now I just do what everybody else does. 
-hmm. Well, and I, I think that these are really complicated phenomena because you could imagine people who would, you know, ride around and then come back to the campfire at the end of the day and tell their stories about what happened that day. So maybe that's the Facebook post at the end of the day. I mean, it just happens to be using technology. Right. Then there's also the kind of frantic, if I don't tell people what I'm doing, then it's not really real. That's a different, so they're both wind up posting at the end of the day, but one person is kind of doesn't have an, a center and the other person is just telling a story at the end of the day. They just happen to be telling it far and wide. Right. So that's why I want to be really careful about judging too much. Yeah, no, than, me too. But, 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 but if it changes how I have a vacation, it's like if I feel like I'd rather just relax or I don't feel like I ever got away, now I'm starting to analyze experience at that primary level mm -hmm. and now I'm having some way of critiquing it. Wait, that was something I saw in the news just recently. It was, it's like the innocent bystander effect, but they have to film it. Instead mm -hmm. of helping somebody that's in need, mm -hmm. They've got to film that to show what, you know, and all these people were there filming, but nobody <coughs> helped. I, you know, I, I just... I mean, that makes it maybe a, it, there's an inter interesting epistemological point there because for most of human history, the testimony of a person about a crime was very strong evidence of that crime. Yet, now yet. people say, well, there's no tapes, or where's the evidence, <laughs> right? So nothing is believable, and now you've had... I forget who said it, but someone said, well, maybe they're now doctoring videos. Uh, right? I think this was said about the Hollywood Access tape, right? It was suggested. Oh, I heard that. It was suggested that maybe that was doctored. So, you know, once, once you, you know, technology has a way of undermining the, the value of testimony. Like, do we trust each other to tell the truth? That's really what it comes back to. It's, again, it's a human relations question. But technology is involved. Distinction between different experiences um, stand um, it, with uh, technology. I wonder if technology changes the idea of primary experience itself, mm -hmm. right? Because the, it sort of um, so I I have hard time um, actually connecting with this virtual world. And like for me, it's another like work to do, like checking Facebook and checking Instagram and things like that. And um, I think um, the people who are always on it feels that it's something, some sort of common ground that they, that they need to catch up every day. Like they, if they don't, don't know uh, what's going on, on on social media, then they don't start with the same sort of um, right. condition of experience at all, right? right? So um, I wonder if it, um, so I think maybe not, the problem is not the, uh, the fact that we're always connected with the world, but the fact that we can detach from it uh, at our convenience. So it's not like if we're always connected with that world that that uh, built um, as a sort of a alternative alternative world, then it may not be so much of an issue. But it's always sort of selective, selectively connected to the world, um, right? Uh, so. I think um, something interesting, like on Instagram, they started, um, they added this function where people start, people, because people um, spend so much time on checking Instagram, they added the function where it says, like, you're all caught up now. So, like, stop it. Sometimes <laughs> 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 it says you're all caught up. So, I think there's that anxiety where you want to know what's going on, and, like, that's the base base of any sort of experience that we built built upon, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So I think the existential displacement that we met, you mentioned is really interesting in that regard. Um, so it's maybe the problem is not that we're always connected, but we're not connected enough in a way um, in that world. Like it's not the world that we dwell on. Right. right. And um, so, um, yeah. I, I don't know if I have a... No, and it make, what, it makes me, what it makes me think of is that there's one of the, one of the critiques that comes from someone like Dermot is that um, to be alive is to be uh, available to the local and to the... because there's spontaneity and chance there. There's... I, I don't know exactly where to go with this, but there's definitely a, a critique of the sort of masculinist element of technology where it's all about control and having only the experience you want to have and only as much as of it as you want to have. So there's a very much a, of a controlling, kind of dominating uh, effect there. 
Whereas to sort of leave yourself open to what's around you means more chance, more novelty, more creativity in a certain sense. Because right. there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of people who live on my block who I, I have talked to. I don't hanker to talk to them <laughs> that much. Right, right. But, but there is something that comes from being neighbors that's important, that, does, that transcends how interesting or stimulating it is. So we have a certain kind of aesthetics that comes from stimulation and constant change and that, yeah. that then makes mm -hmm. my neighbor mm -hmm. seem even more boring than <laughs> yes. um, The technology on the wall is kind of <laughs> 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 We've run out of time, but let's thank our speaker for this. <laughs> And we have uh, plenty of snacks outside and drinks if people want to stay and go about a little bit. Yeah, me too. I'm going to wait. 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 I'm going